case number five. We have here a 58 year old man who came the other day to the oral and maxillofacial surgery clinic at the dental hospital. His chief complaint was a two year history of a previously painless swelling in the roof of his mouth. The lesion, he said, began small on the left side and has gradually and progressively increased in size to reach its present dimensions. Recently, he has been experiencing associated pain accompanied by dysphagia and odinophagia, particularly to solid foods. He also mentions that he occasionally sees blood stained sputum in the mornings upon wakening from bed. He has an unremarkable medical history, but alluded to the fact that he has lost some weight owing to the difficulty in swallowing foods. He denies smoking and alcohol drinking. On clinical examination, there was no regional lymphadenopathy, no evidence of nerve palsy, no fever, but indeed there were subtle signs of weight loss. Intraorally, this well-defined ulcerated mass was observed on the left soft palate extending across the midline to the right. The swelling was firm, slightly tender, not mobile, and was tethered to the underlying structures. The surface ulceration seen here is not uncommon for large intraoral lesions such as this one owing to fictional injury. Head and neck imaging showed deep extensions of the lesion. A biopsy was done and the histopathology revealed a malignant salivary gland neoplasia that has features comprising of polyphratin mucus containing cystic structures as well as epidermoid or squamous cells organized into solid nests. Some cellular pleomorphism, nuclear hyperchromatism, and abnormal mitosis were noted. Moderate stromal sclerosis was also observed. You should now be able to make a definitive diagnosis of mucoepidermoid salivary gland carcinoma, or MEC for short, most likely an intermediate grade variant. MEC is the most common intraoral malignancy of the salivary structures and arises from the ductal system. Remember that in this tumor, the low grade variant is predominantly cystic, whereas the high grade variant mostly contains epidermoid nests of cells. In any case, the clinical differential diagnosis really encompasses both benign and malignant diseases and could be related to any of the normal anatomic structures within the origin of the tumor. Hence, we can have a pleomorphic adenoma or any of the monomorphic adenomas, other malignant salivary gland lesions, a rhabdomyoma, leiomyoma, or malignant versions of these tumors, rhabdomyosarcoma, leiomyosarcoma. Also, you would want to rule out a squamous cell carcinoma, particularly the adenosquamous variant, which has both the glandular and squamous elements similar to the mucoepidermoid carcinoma. Now, most cases of MEC are managed by complete surgical resection with tumor-free margins, and this often achieves excellent long-term local regional control. In selected cases of palatal involvement, LF41 osteotomy may be warranted, followed postoperatively by adjuvant radiotherapy. Some patients may benefit from chemotherapy using epidermal group for receptor tyrosine kinase inhibitors, since some of these tumors acquire mutations along the way that make them overexpress the human epidermal growth factor receptors. Case number six. A middle-aged female in her early 30s has been having episodes of bilateral cervical facial pain for at least three years now. The pain, she said, is aggravated any time she turns her head to either the right or left side, and it's also made worse by swallowing. She denies a history of trauma, and the medical and surgical histories were essentially clean. She mentions that this was not the first time she complained to a healthcare professional regarding the pain, as she has been seen multiple times by many other consultants from different specialties, the most recent being otolaryngology, but still no cause has been found. She tried to control her pain with simple analgesics, but found no relief. A course of amitriptyline was previously prescribed owing to the clinical suspicion of a neuropathic pain, but the symptom relief was minimal. On clinical exam, it was found 
that neck flexion and rotation to either side reproduce the pain symptoms and palpation of both tonsillar fossae intraorally exacerbated these symptoms. On the right side in particular, a bony hard mass was palpable. The decision was then made to perform a detailed radiologic investigation of the neck region, a 3D reconstruction of CT, and the result is what is demonstrated in these images. Here is the skull, base of skull, and these are the cervical vertebrae. Straight off the bat, your attention should be drawn to these two anomalies, elongation of the styloid processes, more remarkable on the right side. The styloid process is a conical bony anatomical structure that projects downwards from the petrous part of the temporal bone located here. It normally measures no more than 2.5 cm and is connected inferiorly to the lesser horn of the hyoid bone by a stylohyoid ligament. An abnormally elongated process is one that is 3 cm or more in length and this can precipitate a complex of symptoms diagnosed as the Eagle syndrome or stylohyoid syndrome. The stylohyoid ligament can also undergo aberrant notification and lead to a similar symptom complex. Of note, however, is that there are people with abnormal stylohyoid elongations that are going about their daily activities without having symptoms whatsoever. These people do not have Eagle syndrome and the elongation is simply regarded as a normal variation of structural anatomy. Of course, it is arguable that the longer the styloid process, the more likely it is for symptoms to occur. But in any case, we are only concerned when it's associated with symptoms, and this is the situation in just about 4% of such individuals. The symptoms could be a result of local pressure effects on neighboring structures, tendinitis at the intestinal point of the stylohyoid ligament, or quite possibly fracture or osteodegenerative changes of the process itself. The complex of symptoms could include cervical facial pain, foreign body throat sensations, painful swallowing or adenophagia, vertigo and syncope when the nearby sympathetic plexus and internal carotid arteries are compressed, or nerve palsies. Transient ischemic attacks are also not uncommon. The definitive treatment is surgical stylodectomy via either a transoral or transcervical approach and this offers about 80% cure rate. The remaining 20% is probably, just probably, because the long styloid may have already done some permanent local neuronal damage before its removal surgically. Remember that there is frequently a delay in arriving at a definitive diagnosis by which time long-term compressive damage may have already occurred. Eagle syndrome is an uncommon cause of facial pain so it does not always come up early in the list of differential diagnosis. The 20% of patients, however, may benefit from the use of medical neuromodulatory therapy, gabapentin, tuloxetine, or pregabalin. Case number 7. A 26-year-old male, a child of consanguinous parents, visited the dental facility with complaints of full mouth gum swellings and pain accompanied with bleeding. These symptoms supposedly started in childhood and have been insidiously increasing in severity. He's had previous gingival debulking procedures in the past only for the swellings to return. In early life, he had a chronic recurrent inflammatory eye disease that left him blind in the left eye by the age of 15. You can appreciate the residual lesions here in the lower conjunctiva. At birth, he was diagnosed with hydrocephalus, which was managed by V patient implantations. Examination of this patient identified an otherwise healthy individual not undergoing treatment for any medical disorder. There were no skin lesions, and the original lymph node exam was normal. He was afebral and again appeared relatively well. Intraorally, there was a general enlargement of the gingival tissues with surface ulcerations which are covered by thick fibrin-rich pseudomembranes. The hyperplastic tissue here resembles a healing annulation tissue but was soft to firm in consistency. Further periodontal evaluation established that 
there was an associated destruction of the parodontia, and this was also observed on radiographic studies. An incisional biopsy was done, and the histopathology showed features of spongiosis, epithelial thickening with branching and interconnecting vertipex, areas of erosion, subepithelial pools of homogeneous hyaline material, which stained positively with the marshal scarlet blue stain, but negative for Congo red. This finding was consistent with fibrin deposition subepithelially. Additionally, a subepithelial chronic inflammatory infiltrate was also observed. The suggestive diagnosis of the case at this time was a lignospirontal disease, synonymously also referred to as the chronic membranous periodontitis. To confirm this, laboratory testing was performed to assess the levels of plasminogen, and not surprisingly, the levels were very much on the low side with less than 5% of enzymatic activity. Plasminogen is a precursor enzyme of plasmin and is necessary in dissolving fibrin formed as a result of the activation of the clotting cascade. The normal activity is usually above 75%, so essentially this patient can be said to have a plasminogen deficiency, specifically the type 1 variant, which is an inherited autosomal recessive disorder. Genetic testing was done to corroborate this finding. This type 1 deficiency is a disorder that impairs wound healing and compromises extracellular clearance of fibrin and leads to the development of lignos or wood-like lesions in various parts of the body. The accumulated fibrin is pro-inflammatory and may manifest as chronic gingivitis, conjunctivitis, vaginitis, pharyngitis, and so on. Lignos conjunctivitis, however, is the most common presentation and often presents in childhood and may lead to corneal scarring and vision loss. Repetitive occlusive hydrocephalus may be seen in a number of individuals as well. On the other hand, type 2 deficiency is characterized by normal levels of the proenzyme but with reduced activity. It is, however, not associated with these symptoms and is considered to be just a polymorphic variation. The definitive treatment for type 1 is recombinant plasminogen replacement if this can be accessed. Other treatment modalities will include infusion with fresh frozen plasma to replenish plasma levels of the enzyme and hence aid dissolution of the lignous pseudomembranes. The use of anti-inflammatory agents, corticosteroids, will help to control the systemic inflammation incited by the fibrin deposits. It is also possible that the levels of plasminogen could be enhanced with hormone therapy, estrogens and progesterones. The gingival enlargement may have to be excised as a temporary measure, but will recur if the systemic deficiency is still present. It goes without saying that maintenance of a good oral hygiene is imperative. Warfarin, which is an inhibitor of the coagulation cascade, prevents the formation of fibrin clots and has been used successfully in a number of patients. Antibiotics are also recommended to control any local infection. As this is a multisystemic disorder, review by the relevant specialist is important. Neurology, ophthalmology, ENT, obstetrics, and equally important, a genetic counselor. Now, before leaving this case, let me quickly list some of the lookalike lesions that should form part of a differential diagnosis for lignose gingivitis. These will include amyloid gingival enlargement, which is the reason why a Congo red stain should be performed, drug induced gingival overgrowth. Here, a relevant drug history will be apparent, for instance, the use of nifedipine, amlodipine, phenytoin, valproic acid, cyclosporine, and so on. Nephrotizing ulcerative gingivitis often will go away after antibiotic therapy and low cortibribin procedures. Leukemic gingivitis. In this case, the laboratory workup will show abnormal white blood cells and the histology will reveal these to be infiltrating the gingival tissues. Then we have oral squamous cell carcinoma, especially when the lesion is focal rather than generalized. Alright, expect to find case examples of these disorders in subsequent series of this video atlas.